preaching and I walked too close to her. She reached out and pulled a briar sheet out of her sleeve. <laughs> there was something in my sleeve. Yeah. Again, I'm honored to be here. And uh, Pastor Mike, Rachel, you guys have such a heart for God <coughs> that I believe it parallels the heart God has for us. I mean, I desire to have the compassion that you guys have. And, and uh, you guys are so blessed to have people that really care for you deeply. Amen. And will be there for you. Uh, Rachel, you've been on a heart all morning. And I'm not going to give you this as a word from God. It's a word from me. And it confirms by the Spirit that maybe God initiated it. But you have such a heart for the people. But I think we'll have to know, don't think you have to carry your legs. Enjoy the trip. can to help and enjoy your day, enjoy it, and just because they have problems, don't mean you have to carry the concern over those problems. And God wants you to, these to be the funnest days of your life. Amen? Is that okay with you? <laughs> no, we love you, I love you, Patty. We highly respect you this ministry, we recognize the price of the Christ, there's a price paid for being a minister. And recognize it, you just know that uh, we know that some of the challenges can be. Amen. Amen. And uh, we want you to do it. And I, I took me some time. I learned to enjoy it. I took my wife some time. It probably took her three or four hours. She learned to enjoy it. <laughs> or more. Uh, what Pastor Mike was saying, what a great follow up about the two sides of the grace message that he brought forth, and, and I, I've struggled all morning about whether to bring part two of this message or not. What I'd like to do is make a few statements about what I talked about last night. <coughs> offer the notes to whoever wants them. I can send them to you and you can distribute them whatever with all these verses and such. <coughs> I think I want to change gears this morning. The reason is because last night was kind of a heavy message, and I'd like to give you something a little more... Uh, Exciting this morning. Amen. But I do need to make a few statements. One is uh, somebody came to me after service last night and they said, Pastor Jack, the word says once we're saved, we have eternal life. If we can lose our salvation, then how do we have eternal life? Am I on? Can you hear me okay? <coughs> Did I not turn it on? Andy. Right. There it's on. I had it on mute. That's okay. better. Okay. I wouldn't hear any feedback when I thought. Uh, we have to hear about eternal life. And so I didn't have time to answer last night, but I'm going to speak to you just for a minute this morning. How many believe once you're saved, you have eternal life? The word makes it clear for you, don't it? But I want to explain this fashion. I, I took a shower this morning before I came. You guys said, praise God, Pastor John. Uh -huh. <laughs> I try to take a shower every day. Amen. Amen. Sometimes twice a day. Sometimes three or four times a month. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're going to make this for light part of this morning. Amen. And uh, as long as you're under a shower that's running, you were eternally wet. Yes. You have a problem believing that? No. Yeah. But if you step out of the shower, you're no longer eternally wet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're in the right standing with God, you have eternal life. The power, the anointing, the blessing, life eternal is yours. But if you, by your actions, your decisions and what you embrace in life, cause you to step out of the shower, now you're no longer under that umbrella of eternal life. Do you see that? Yes. Eternal life didn't change. You change your position whether you were under it or not. So is that clear that for you? Yeah. For anybody? As well, turn to 1 John chapter 3. I want to touch on this verse. Because people say, well, I've been made righteous. I've been made righteous by the, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My sins are washed away by His blood. Praise God for that. And we were talking about last night this, this hyper grace, this ludicrous grace message that's deceiving so many people. Deceiving people want to either want to embrace sin, they want an excuse to sin, or they really don't know the word. You cannot 
know the word and embrace that. I mean, we, we read Jude last night. Pastor Mike mentioned uh, Romans chapter 6. Again, I count this morning, I've got over 30 passages. Probably, you know, close to 100 verses where the word talks about. Not, not counting Romans chapter 6 and Jude. That deal with, you can lose out with God. If you don't maintain a right relationship with Him. Do you see this? So 1 John chapter 3, I want you to go to verse number 7. It says, little children, how many know that's us? We're the children of God. Let no man deceive you. Now what does that mean? That means fool. That means somehow pull the blinders over your eyes. It means somehow to get you to believe the wrong thing. Let no man deceive you. In other words, there's going to be an effort by the enemy and by those that are used by the enemy and because he says a man cause you to believe wrong things as a child of God. Amen. And it says, he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. There were doeth righteousness. There were doeth in the Greek means practices. Applies. Lives. And we've already heard Pastor Mike say, once you're saved, you know, you know you're, you're made righteous. The blood cleanses you of sin. And if you try to pick up yourself and do everything of yourself from then on, now you're under legalism. So what does it mean to do with righteousness? That means you cooperate with God and the anointing to set you free of that which is not righteous. That which is not holy. Let me explain that a little, a little better. Again, last night I said, when I got saved, I said, God, I've been, I've been a drunk for 12 years, drugs, whatever. I need help. I knew that I was doing things that God would approve of. The night I got saved, I said, God, help me. And supernaturally, God did what I tried for years to do. He delivered me from alcohol. I couldn't do it. I had tried for 12 years, the longest I was ever sober was two weeks. I mean, you hug toilets long enough, you know, calling out to the God Ralph. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> the ceramic God. <laughs> You'll want to quit. How many Sunday mornings did I say, I'll never drink again? And by Sunday night, I was plastered again. But then I got saved. I said, God, I need help. And a supernatural force. I didn't even know about the power of that. But a force hit me, and all of a sudden, I know I didn't want to drink anymore. And now for 33 years, I'm not a recovering alcoholic. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Yes. And the power of God has set me free. Yes. So the life I now live, I live by the grace or the power of God. So I attempt now to live holy, but I, I have cooperate with the Holy Spirit to lead me and to empower me to do so. Be a follower. Yes. I'm not thinking if I live a perfect enough life that you know then God will approve of me. He approves of me now. But because of that approval, I'm going to walk in a fashion that will please him. Do you see this? And I've got to endeavor of myself and with God's help and by the leading of the Spirit to live a life of righteousness or a life of holiness. You're made righteous by the cross, but now you've got to walk out what God did in you. In fact, that's really what holiness is, is walking on the outside what God already put on you in the inside. But if you walk on the outside, contrary to what God put on the inside, you stand to contaminate the inside. Mm -hmm. Or to, how can I say, compromise that standing. And I want to stay under the spout when the glory comes out. How about you? Yes. Yes. So there's a need that we do righteousness. There, there, it also says in Scripture that the, the, the devil Satan has ministers of righteousness. You aware of that? I believe it's 1 Corinthians. Let me make sure here. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is my first message.
Remember, remember the lie? Remember the progression of lies we talked about that take you to believe this? If you confess Jesus, you're born again. I know it's true. It's in the Word. If you're born again, you've been made righteous through the cross. That's in the Word. How many believe that? It's true. And now that you're born again and made righteous, you're a son of God. Join over with Christ. How many believe that? It's in the Word. And now that you're a son of God, what father would ever turn his back on his son regardless of if going to sin or not? Oh, you're catching on, aren't you? Yes. That's not the word. God repeatedly says you can lose that. See, I may be in this for a few more minutes. So I'm here, here, right now. Second, Second Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan has his own form of revelation he brings to Christians. Yes, it's a contaminated form of revelation. It's a form that will try to get them off course or to believe in something other than that what Jesus is able to do in our life. It says, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end should be according to their works. Apparently, Satan has his own preachers out there declaring that you're righteous in the cross, it's finished, and you can do what you want. That's really what it's talking about. I don't want to fall into that trap. How about you? Amen. Let's go down to the passage on this. I feel like I'm going to stand for just a little bit. Go to Ezekiel. Well, now you're going to the Old Testament. Yeah, I believe the old is the new. <laughs> uh, hidden, buried. The new is the old unveiled. We're to study both, right? Mm -hmm. Ezekiel. And I believe we want to go to chapter 18. Now look at this. Ezekiel chapter 18. Look at verse 21. I'm going to read through this passage. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and not die. Now this is a representation of being born again. Yeah. If a wicked man will turn to God and follow God, he'll live and not die. I'm thankful I'm in that category. How about you? Yeah. <coughs> All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. In other words, God says, I won't even see any sin they commit from that point on. Let me restate that. I won't hold them accountable for those sins. Amen. Amen. If he's attempting to follow after the ways of God. But verse 20, 23 says, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Verse 24. But when the righteous, say that's me, as Christians, but when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, what did he do? He got out of the shower. He quit following after God and God's ways. And pursuing to be delivered from that which has contaminated him in the past. When the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked men doeth, shall he live? It's a question, right? Shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass, that he hath trespassed. And in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Now, what Ezekiel saying here, or God saying in the book of Ezekiel, if the wicked man turns to God, he shall live. Now, in the New Testament, the representation of we shall be born again, we'll be saved. But it says, if that saved person in right standing with God goes back to sin willfully, is determined they're going to live in it and assuming it's going to be okay, God says, is he going to live? He shall surely die. And then God says, how many of you just say, God, forget your sin? <coughs> he washes away, it's gone. But now he says, when you turn back to sin, I'll forget everything that you did good. It works both directions. And God is not a sucker. We read last night, the ones that go back into sin, willfully trample the blood of Christ 
as an unholy thing. I want to follow the category. How about you? Now, I want to change gears this morning and talk about stepping into your destiny. How many want to fulfill their call of God? You know, again, my background is engineering, so I'm very logical in my approach to things. And the more I studied the Word, I found out God's a logical God. How many believe if you climbed on top of this church and jumped, you know, stepped off, which way would you go? Up or down? Yeah. Down. How many times would you go down? Once. Every time. <laughs> Once, right? Every time you stepped off. I mean, if you threw rocks off the roof, they're going to go down every single time. The rocks aren't going to go. Why? Because there's a law called gravity. Yes. It's highly predictable. It always works the same. You've heard me say this before. You've heard me. Well, God is the one that created that law. He created this entire universe that always works in a predictable fashion. And if God created a predictable universe, we can know he's predictable. See, we've been lied to in the church in the past and told, well, God's ways are, ways are too high for us to understand. You never know what God's going to do. Sometimes he answers prayer, sometimes he doesn't. That's not scriptural. Come on. God lays out ways we can access his power. Amen. Yes. Do you follow me? <laughs> and to step into your destiny, it's important we learn these ways. Amen. Now, I want to take you through seven steps this morning. Have I shared this before? Seven P's of fulfilling your destiny. God showed me several years back seven steps to fulfilling his assignment for your life. How many want to know? Amen. Amen. And interestingly, all of them start with the letter P. Amen. And the first step that God wants you to move into to fulfill your destiny is called purpose. You were not created for no reason. There are no worthless people. You have a divine purpose for your life. Amen? Amen. You know, people that fall into, into drugs and alcohol, <clears throat> that commit suicide, that run with the devil, don't realize God's got a higher purpose. Amen. If you really knew that God created you specifically, individually, with a <clears throat> purpose, you would, you would embrace your life with much more respect for yourself. <laughs> Do you follow me? Yes. And so... Uh, can you follow my accent all right? Yeah. I didn't even have an accent until I met my wife. <laughs> I blame everything on her. She's well able to carry the blame. Amen. Uh, your, your number one, how can I say, step to move into destiny is your purpose. And we all have the same purpose. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. I don't plan to keep you very long this morning. I'd say, you know, about 2 or 4 o'clock we'll be out here. See, I say that so when you get out by 2, you're, you're, you're kind of <laughs> <laughs> Have I told the halfway story in here before? I, I've told it a lot of different churches. I forget where I've told it. It's probably, you know, 20 years ago. Probably more. I had gone to uh, Madison, Indiana. I was ministering a message there. And uh, it's a huge church. They had they run a huge building. But only about five people were in the church at the time. And so I'm getting ready to preach, and in comes this woman that is totally drunk. You know, she's 50 ish or so, and she's blasted. And I think she lived on the streets or whatever. You know, she came in for the church service. So I preached for probably an hour, 15 minutes or so like that. And I was getting ready to close, but I thought, well, I'll just play around. I said, well, uh, we're about halfway. It's teasing. <laughs> she stood up in the, in, in the middle of the message and goes, halfway? Halfway? <laughs> Probably about two 
verse 10, Paul says, that I may know him. That I may know him. Just stop right there. That's as far as we're going to go. Your purpose is the same as every other person on earth. Your purpose is to know God. God created man with an assignment no other created being has. That's to have a relationship with our Creator. You were made to know Him, to fellowship with Him. He, you are the one entity made in the image of God so He can share with you on somewhat of an even, even level. You understand that? You have God's inclinations. You have His heart because you're born again. You've got His, His, His emotions even. God made you like Him. Amen. That's why Scripture talks about we should, we should take care of this temple made in His name. Why does God hate homosexuality? Not the homosexual, but the homosexuality. Why? It tampers with the image He made us in. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So we should embrace who we are. Yeah. And your purpose is to, is to develop a relationship with the Creator. Yeah. Have a prayer life where you speak to Him and you expect Him to speak back. Yeah. I heard so many, even well-known men of God, I wouldn't say well-respected in circles of people that walk in the power of God, but men of God that are known say it's ridiculous for anybody to believe that God speaks to man today. I heard that on a news program one time by a well-known Christian commentator that God gave us the word he doesn't speak to us anymore. Well, I've been following the wrong voice again for 33 years that God's been speaking to me. Amen. And you, you need to run me out of here right now if God doesn't speak to people. Because I'm apparently, you know, out there somewhere. God speaks to us. He wants to speak to you more than you want to hear Him. Yes, amen. Now, of course, He speaks you out of His Word quite a bit. The vast majority of God speaking to me is as I read the Word. Yes. Amen. Why? Because it's His voice to us. But then he wants to unveil his word to us and he will speak to you. He will give you directions. How can you be led of the Spirit if you can't hear God? And we are to endeavor to know him. The reason you were saved is because when you were born again, God put in you a new heart, a new nature, made righteous. Do you follow me? Because now you're made righteous, you have access to come before God because before you were a sinner, you had no free access to God. Sin separated you from Creator God. But now through the cross, we can come in with boldness and confidence by faith in that sacrifice. And we should. We should be taking every opportunity we can to speak with God. Amen. Amen. I mentioned last night, or no, it was Friday night, Habakkuk chapter 2, where Habakkuk the prophet <coughs> declared the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as water from the sea. But Habakkuk said in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I'm going to stand up on my watch and set me up on the tower. That means he's going to go pray. But then he said something. And I will watch to see what I shall answer when I'm approved. In other words, Habakkuk, an Old Testament prophet, expected to hear from God when he went to pray. Habakkuk was not born again. He was not filled with his spirit. He was not cleansed from sin like we are. Yet he expected to hear God. Amen. His sins were covered, but not cleansed. Right. And he expected to hear God. How much more should we as New Testament saints with much more than, than Habakkuk had and with even a better covenant, should we expect for God to speak to us? That's right. He wants to reveal amazing things to us. Amen? Amen? Amen. So your, your purpose is the same for every, every, not just every believer, but every per person on earth. It's called to have a relationship with God. What do you mean we're all called? If, if they're not saved, how can they have a relationship? They can't, but they're called to get saved and to have a relationship with God. Jesus died for everyone. Whosoever will can have that relationship. Yes. If they'll give us their life to Him. Yes. Do you see that? Yes. We're all designed to know Him. Yes. Did you follow what I, what I was trying to say there? Yes. He died for all. Not everybody will step into it. Not everyone will be saved. But those that do have a right to fellowship with God freely. Yes. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. Because he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I'm a son. I sing it, but everybody would be leaving if I did. <laughs> I stepped over the lawn and I sang, he's so fun. <laughs> After I broke that one down, he's, he's had it notarized. And, <laughs> oh, let me forget that one. So let's go to step two. How many know step one is pretty automatic? I mean, just spend time with God. Mm -hmm. But what's the second step of fulfilling our destiny? Turn over to Ephesians chapter four. And I'm just giving you an outline today. What I'm teaching you often I will teach. And because there's seven steps, I'll take seven weeks to do it. Spend a week on each step. So today you're just getting an outline. You can fill in the rest later. But if you learn this out, if you will learn this outline I'm giving you today, it will enable you to step into your destiny if you'll do it. I want to hear it. How about you? Amen. Well, I already know what I've heard. But I'll do it. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 1. I therefore, the front prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you are called. The word vocation there means you're calling. Verse 4 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. God has a calling on your life. So he wants you to do specifically this different from anybody else. The second step of fulfilling your destiny is discovering your plan. What's God's plan for you? God's plan for me is different from than his plan for you. But his plan for you is no less important, no less necessary, no less level of rewards will be granted if you do your plan. I'm convinced that God rewards us based on our obedience to what he's called us to do. Yes. And if God's called me to teach, he'll reward me based on how well I'm faithful in my preaching and teaching. And how much I, I'm willing to do with excellence. We're seeing it right. Let's say you're called to clean the church. That's your calling. I believe if you do it with excellence, with attitude, with anointing, faithfully, when you get to heaven, your rewards will be the same as mine. Maybe better if you do it better than I do. Do you follow me? It's not based on what we do. It's based on what God calls you and how well we do it. Amen. That's why you don't want to get out of your calling. So God said, there's one hope of your calling. Find out what God has you to do. He gave me a relationship. Now ask him, now what would you have me do? Let me throw this in very quickly. People come to me all the time and say, what do you want me to do? What would God have me do? Because I've asked God that myself for years. What do you want me to do? And I've discovered over 25 years of ministry that God's more concerned about who you become than what you do. Shall I say that again? Yes. God's more concerned about who you become by letting the Word change you than what you do for Him. There's a whole lot of people out there that have not let God change them trying to do something and they're making a mess. Or they're creating a hypocritical image. Even men that carry some giftings are not really walking in the fullness of integrity. And how much of a... a how much of a, of a black mark can that be <coughs> Christ? I personally, for years, have been more focused on God changing me than concerned about what God would have me do. You follow me? And I'm convinced if I will let God change me, He'll get me into what I need to do. Yeah. If God can change me from the inside out, and then I can walk in that love, which, by the way, we have the books in the back, $15. You can sign up for service. I forgot my commercial wallet. <laughs> I'm convinced that if we will endeavor to walk in integrity, walk in truth, walk in love, that God will position where you need to be. But He wants to reveal to you a plan. And here's the secret whatever God's plan is for you will always be greater than you can do of yourself. Yes. Because He wants to, he wants to partner with you in doing it. And if he just gives you things to do that you can already do, then you won't need him. You'll try to do it yourself. Amen. Come on. In 1991, September 1991, 
God told me to start a Bible study in my home. Now, my natural inclination is I hate to speak publicly. At least I did then. I couldn't. I was so I was so intimidated by standing up and speaking in front of people. I couldn't want to say my name in front of a group. I had some high-level jobs with IBM. I worked in some, some important positions, but they realized I was not a very eloquent speaker. So they sent me to a service training. They sent me to public speaking classes. They sent me to Dale Carnegie, trying to help me out. Has anybody ever taken Dale Carnegie? They, they, every week you do two speeches in front of the whole group, two speeches. And at the end of the, end of the year, you do a speech in front of all the families of all the people that came. Uh, you know, they rent a big auditorium. And they tell you from now sit now, you have to be in class, you can only miss two classes and still graduate. And I had to graduate to get my reimbursement from, from the company. So when I heard people skip two classes and they told me what the classes were, I immediately said I'm skipping that last one because that's in front of everybody. <laughs> I really didn't have the right expectation of graduating with <laughs> eloquence. And so I would be a nervous wreck just in a group if they said, can you just tell your name and you know what you do? And I'd be like, oh, Jesus is coming to me next. I just, I don't, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes. And in September 1991, God says, I want you to start a Bible study in your house. And he gave me all these details. It was, it was all, virtually an audible voice describing everything. The one audible bit of mine's will have And I'm going, God, I don't speak publicly. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't even touch on that. He just said, and here's when you hold the money nights and all these things. And uh, I said, okay. So I went home and I told my wife, she was really thrilled about it. <laughs> <laughs> we held up in our basement, we had a finished basement. And uh, uh, I made a little pulpit out of a camera stand and a piece of plywood. And people came. We had quite a few people show up. First class. I spent 20 hours studying for my first class. <laughs> 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 that was before we had the Bible on computer and such. I'm, I got my strong supporters. I'm looking up all this. 20 hours because I'm going to make sure I was ready. So I'm like what Patty did today for, for 15 minutes. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm like, everything in me is freaking out. God, i got to get behind it. i got to speak. And when I step behind it with my notes, the anointing of the Holy Ghost hit me to teach the Word. Amen. And now for 26 years, it's never lived to me. Hallelujah. I'm still not an eloquent speaker. I need, I need to change my confession. In Jesus' name I am. Amen. Amen. Outside of the anointing, outside of the pulpit, I still struggle to speak publicly. But I know before I get behind the pulpit, say, God, I need you now. And for 26 years, he always shows up. Unless I get into pride, then I'll say, you can do this on your own. And I'll struggle again. So, my calling requires me to remain totally dependent upon God. And your call will require you to be totally dependent upon God. Mm -hmm. You may be an eloquent speaker, so we'll have you do something else you can't do of your own. And it will always require more strength than you have, more wisdom than you have, more eloquence than you have, more charisma, and always more money. Mm -hmm. I heard Jerry Savell say one time, everything God's ever called me to do required money. And it was always more money than I had when he told me to do it. So what do you do? You need God's provision. You need God's supply. So the calling God has for you is one that will stretch you beyond your own comfort levels. But if you really want to fulfill his assignment, you'd be willing to cooperate with him to do it. Because what a joy for me now to step behind the pulpit and share the truths of the word. Now, without God, I could never do it. Without having obeyed him before, I would never be here. Amen. Amen. And your fulfillment in life is in fulfilling God's assignment for you. Yes, and I want that. Be willing for God to take you out of this mindset, well, I'm just going to church. That's the church I belong to. You know, I just, I'm a nice 
nice person, there's so much more to it than that. If you don't know what God would have me do, come to your pastor and say, what, what would you have me do? And then when he says, get, get to doing it with excellence and watch God show up. It'll take you further. Some of my first ministry training was I was asked by one of the ministers to go to the nursing homes and, 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 and minister, minister to, to the elderly. And I thought, my goodness, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do it. But okay, I've been asked by my pastor to do it. And when I did, God showed up. Amen. I believe I'm here today because I was obedient to minister to nursing homes. Amen. Or whatever assignment I had. Amen? Amen. <laughs> hey, I just don't think I can do that. You're right, you can't. Yeah. Which is where you want to be. Because Paul said, when I'm weak, then he is strong through me, right? Yes. You're strong through Christ. So God has a plan for your life. It's going to be beyond what you can do of yourself. So because it's beyond your, what you can do of yourself, you need the third step, which is provision. Now provision can be money. It can be wisdom. It can be partners. It can be strength. It can be whatever you need to fulfill the call. Me, I needed a teaching anointing to teach. I need the peace of God to hit me even step behind the pulpit. And whatever God has for you, there's a provision you need. Yes. And you don't have to think very hard to know what it is. It's a thing you can't do yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so provision is something that only God can supply. So many people try to start a church or start a work for God, and, and because they think, you know, because they think. They have some money or some giftings, that's all they need, and they get into it and they burn out. Or they run out of money. Or nobody comes. What they're trying to do it without the anointing, they're trying to do it themselves. Recognize that what God calls you to do, if He calls you, He'll fund it. <laughs> when Jesse Laplantis <coughs> built the, uh, the big complex down in New Orleans, and, and uh, when he was building it, all these bills were coming in. He didn't have the money. And he, and he says, he, I had, it had been too long ago, I heard him say, it. when bills come in and he doesn't have the money, he just tells God, he always says, God, you got mail. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because God called him to do it. Mm -hmm. God then has a responsibility to yeah. fund it. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have us sow a seed and believe this, but it's not our job to go fundraise. It's our job to believe for God's money. Right. So, provision always requires God's interaction and intervention. It, apply, it, it requires His supernatural uh, uh, bringing to us what we need. Yes. Amen. But how do we get that provision? Is it because we just lay on our face and we hope and pray and say, Oh God, please, please, please? I don't believe so. God doesn't answer the prayers of day. <coughs> Amen. God doesn't answer the prayers of faith. That's right. So we come to the fourth step in our, in our process of fulfilling our destiny. Turn to uh, 2 Peter. Chapter 1. this morning I'll be writing these down and show you the progression of steps. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the world corruption of the world. Let me start over and slow down. Yes. Whereby <laughs> Whereby are given unto us Exceeding great and precious promises. That by these precious promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What I want you to see in this verse is God's given us exceeding great and precious promises. How many know the Bible is a promise book? What's an example of a promise in the world? What is a promise in the world? It's the verse that is declared God's supply for our life. Yes. How many know the word?
Lord says, by his stripes you were healed. Yes. That is a promise of provision for healing for your life. Yes. How many of us says that my God shall supply all your need? Yes. According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What's that a promise of? Financial supply or whatever your need is. Yes. When God has said, I'm going to bring you your provision. Step three is provision, right? When God says, I'm going to bring your provisions, he brings it into the form of promises. Have you heard that the word is, uh, is the seed? The promise of God are seeds. Mm -hmm. Sow one up to sow, right? Mm -hmm. And seeds are actually packaged portions of God's provision. Promises of God are packaged portions of God's provision. Say that five times real fast. <laughs> For example, you need healing in your body, and there's a seed or a promise of God in, your, in the Word for healing. In fact, there's many promises of that, right? You need finances. How many promises of God are in the Word that God will supply what you need? In fact, I have a term for seeds. Seeds are pre-programmed packages of potential power. Say so that one five times real fast. <laughs> when you have a seed, let's say you have just a, a seed out of an apple, apple tree seed. In that seed is all the potential to produce an apple tree with an abundance of other apples and seeds. But that seed, that power in that seed is only potential power until you plant it. Yes. And Peter Piper picked a peck of pickle butters. Amen. <laughs> I have fun when I preach. If nobody else says I have fun. And my wife usually laughs. <laughs> Sometimes just out of kindness. <laughs> and a seed is a pre-programmed. In other words, the very RNA of an apple tree is in that seed. It's programmed to produce an apple tree. Can you plant an apple seed and get an orange tree? Can you plant an apple seed and get a giraffe? Well, if they like apples, what's a street tree? <laughs> it's programmed to produce an apple tree. Pre-programmed. By God himself in the beginning. Put that program into those seeds. It's potential power in there until you plant it to produce that apple tree. Amen. Amen. So a seed is a pre-programmed pattern of potential power. <laughs> And the promises of God are seeds. They are pre-programmed packages of God's potential power. So let's, let's back up and go through our steps so far again. That is the purpose for your life to know Him. Right? Yes. Out of knowing Him, He will reveal to you His plan for your life. Yes. But to do His plan because it's more than you can do of yourself. You'll need His provision. Yes. But how do you get His provision? Well, it's in the form of promises. See, so many people try to skip some of these steps. Maybe they know God and they've heard His plan for their life and they know they need His resources. So what do they do? They get the place they need the resources and they go try to raise it themselves through a fundraiser. Or work two or three jobs to get enough money to do it. Or beg the church for the money. Oh, we need to get this money. Bring it in here. And they're skipping God's step of actually how He wants us to fulfill our destiny. When you have a need in your life, don't go to those you think can supply it. Go to the Lord and find out where God said He would supply it. That's right. And find the verses God said belong to you and plant them. Yes. <coughs> you plant them, you speak them. So His provision is in the form of promises. I am a student of the promises of God. I, I recognize when I'm reading the word and there's a promise, I say that one's for me. Amen. So I live my life claiming the promises of God. Yes. I go to bed declaring I, <laughs> he gives his beloved sweet sleep. Amen. I'm claiming that promise. Amen? Amen. I, I claim I have strength. I claim I have wisdom of God. I claim my body's healed. I claim I have good memory. All based on promises of God. 
So my day is spent speaking what God said I can have. Why? I'm a seed sower. Yes. And the seed, the soil is the heart of man. I want to sow the seed into my life. Yes. Do you see this? Yes. Well, there's needs I have other than physical needs. There's needs I have other than, you know, being able to remember something. I also have needs for my church, needs for my family. What am I doing? I'm claiming those promises for my family. Yes, amen. My wife hasn't always been as sweet as she is right now. I used to have some major trouble with her. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we went through some challenges earlier in our marriage. It's been weeks ago, and we had, my goodness. <laughs> For years, the devil was trying to take her out of the calling on her life. She didn't see herself as a pastor's wife. She's like, I just don't think I'm called a good pastor's wife. Will you marry me? I'm a pastor, so there you go. That really didn't go very far. But I would speak over my marriage all the time. My wife should be the fruitful vine within my house. And my children are branches about my table. She couldn't go anywhere because I had a promise of that. I was speaking. Amen. And I have no doubt she was speaking over me that my, my husband is not a bum yet. He is my direction. <laughs> the promises will cover every area of need in your life. Not just that, you know, the high calling, but for whatever you need. It's in the form of a promise. And too many Christians are trying to beg and plead with God to meet a need for the life versus sow a seed. Versus trust the word is applied. Versus believe God for it. Yes. Amen. Jesus said if you believe and speak, a mountain has to be moved out of your way. Right. Which brings us to step number five. How many want to know step number five? Yes. Are you following this so far? Yes. What I'm giving you this morning is an orderly process to fulfill your divine destiny. Mm -hmm. And I don't care who you are. Your destiny fulfillment will follow these seven steps. And if you try to go around these steps, you try to do it a different way, you try to do it by your own effort, your own supply, and it's going to fall short. Yes. In fact, these are actually seven steps of how to live by faith. Amen. How to live in the supernatural. We can, we can give many different names. Step number five. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 61, I'm going to read the whole chapter. But Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Remember that? And they started guessing. That are John the Baptist, other Elijah, one of the prophets. So Jesus finally said directly to the, to, the, to the twelve, but who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Remember that? Yes. And Jesus said to Peter, Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, right? right. He, he gained that revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So after he said that, over to verse number 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, when I was first saved, they told me that there was a set of keys that the devil used to carry around. It was a big loop on his thing. And, he was, and they were always skeleton keys. They were making real skeletons. And because uh, he was the devil. <laughs> And Jesus went to hell and he took back those keys so he could unlock, unlock the prisoners. Well, I really don't think Jesus needed a set of keys to unlock any lock. You follow me? I don't believe there were really a set of keys. They were a set of key principles to access the power of God. See, again, from engineering, we always talked about keys. Keys to operate or using electricity. Keys of heat transfer. Keys of combustion. 
Keys represent something that lets you activate something. Do you follow me? A principle or a process by which you can accomplish something. My wife likes to cook. Amen. How we're only she wants to cook the things she likes to eat. <laughs> that's the key, yes, that's right. So she knows there's some keys to making a cake. How many know if you don't grease the pan in many cases you're in trouble? This yeah. used to be like that. I don't know if it's still like that or not. They make so much you know, non-stick stuff. If you don't season your iron skillet, it's going to rust. There are keys to cooking. There's keys to whatever you do. If you're a pipe fitter, you, you do plumbing, there's keys to plumbing. There's key, whatever job you do, you know there's keys to what you do. And unless you learn those, you can't do that job. Is that pretty much true? <clears throat> well, there are keys to operating in the kingdom of God and accessing that power. Jesus declared, if you obey my sayings, you build your house on a rock. Remember that? If you don't obey my sayings, you go to the house of the same. So again, being a person that wasn't raised in church, I wasn't taught in a lot of religious explanations, you know. When I say, if you obey my sayings, I want to know what we're saying. Is this okay? Am I going too long? <laughs> what were the sayings of Jesus? What were his sayings? Because we have four gospels full of them, right? Mm -hmm. Plus part of the book of Acts. What were his sayings? Well, Pastor Jack, he taught about the cross. He mentioned it a couple times, but not very much. You follow me on this? Mm -hmm. Well, he taught us to feed the poor. He mentioned that one or two times that they fed the poor. That wasn't what he taught. He taught about sin. Not really. He mentioned some of it. You follow me? He taught about the end times. Yeah, we have a couple chapters about that. You want to know what Jesus taught when he came? He taught about the kingdom of heaven. Yes, yes. And what he taught, go to Matthew chapter 11. I mean, Mark chapter 11. You mentioned it a while ago. Mark chapter 11. Verse 22 says, And Jesus answering, saying unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he that shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, this would be something he was saying, right? I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. Have faith. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And you shall have them. Yes. How many of Mark chapter 4 we talked about the parable of the sower? The sower wanted to sow. And then he said, and the seed is the word of God. Luke 8 11. The seed is the word of God. Sow the word. Jesus came and taught how the kingdom of God operates. What principles allow the kingdom to function? I, uh, somebody, they've given us some, given us some on a permanent loan, a writing on board. And uh, we didn't have one, and they had one, a fairly nice one. Yet they're, now her son is mowing her grass forward with a zero turn. She's sitting out in the rain. Will you take it home and just, Use it so it doesn't just fall apart. I said, well, I think I can do that. <laughs> so I went to get the lawnmower. I loaded it up on my trailer, took it on my loaded, got it started, and needed to back it up. I could rather back it up. I'm used to there's a reverse, you know, on, the, on a shifter. There's a reverse. There was no reverse. I'm looking, oh, how do you back this thing up? I mean, before, I can't back up. I needed to back up. When you pull in the garage, unless you want to lift it and turn it around like this, it's not heavy. I didn't try that. You need a reverse. And finally, I discovered the pedal that makes it go forward. If you take your toe and pull it backwards, it goes backwards. It's got a two-way, it's a John Deere, it's a two-way pedal. Now, you may be used to it, I've never seen that before. So I'm still taking my toe and pulling it backwards to back up. I did this for a while and finally, look, there's another pedal down there. What's it do? 
And when I pressed it, it made the pedal go backwards. <laughs> and I didn't use my toe, I could just step on it and it made it work. <laughs> I found that the key to running that tractor in reverse is press on the pedal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to with this. If you want to access the power of God, there are key principles, I call them kingdom principles, kingdom laws, that let you access the power. I did a teaching in my church a few years ago on, on principles of the kingdom, and I had close to 50 principles I wrote down. For example, being able to sow seed, speaking with authority, speaking with faith, honor your mother and father, which is the first promise of the family, that you live on the world with you, live on the world with you and the earth. Those are principles that govern whether you get God's results or not. Too many Christians just hoping and praying something happens versus doing God's way. Yes, I know. And we'll study these principles. We can get the same results Jesus got. Because here's what he did. He went to taught these principles, and then he would demonstrate them. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, he taught all day on the parable of the sower. Then he told about how a, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like a seed planted and springs up night and day, you know not how. Then he taught him about the, the kingdom of God being as a tree, the, uh, the, you know, from a rain of mustard seed that grows up, the birds lodge, lodge, lodge in the branches. I'm going too fast. I'm trying to speak like I'm from Pittsburgh or something. <laughs> and then he said, okay, disciples, get into the boat. And a great storm arose. And he just taught them all day about how to, do, how to operate this power, and a storm will rise, and they all freak out. <laughs> and they go wake you up, and he says, Peace, be still, and the storm's calm. Then he says, Why are you so fearful? I just taught you how to do this. They land, on the, they land in, 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 the, in, the, in the land of the uh, Gergesenes, where the demonic was, and a demon made some. <clears throat> I'm sure they're all hiding behind Jesus now. And he delivers the man. He's showing how these things work. If you want God's results, discover how things work in his kingdom. See, I'm going to Africa again in, in November. And we'll be flying a plane over the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm glad that people design that plane that understand the laws of flight. Mm -hmm. There's government flight. Thrust, lift, strength of materials. That somebody didn't say, hey, let's try this one. Y'all all aboard. <laughs> <laughs> they study these laws. As an engineer, we study the laws of physics. Well, now as a, as a, as a teacher of the word, I study the laws of the kingdom. And if you want guaranteed results, you've got to use the ways God said you'll get guaranteed results. Look at look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Or some form of it. I'm, 
I confess healing over my life through the day. Any, if I have a twinge of pain, I'm going, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. By his stripes, I was healed. Why? Because I have a guaranteed promise. I'm going to access it by the principles of the kingdom. Yes, I Just review again very quickly. God has a plan, a purpose for your life to know Him. Out of the purpose He will reveal to you is plan. His plan is always greater than you can do of yourself, so you need His provision. How do you get His provision? It comes in the form of promises. How do we get the power, or how do we get the provision out of the promises? By the principles that access that provision. Yes. So the key principles we operate in to, to live by faith is to speak the promise, act on it, and stand till it manifests. Well, first you meditate on it until you have faith in it. Then you speak it, act on it, and stand until you get it. And everything you want to receive from God is going to come through that process. Amen. Revelation, meditation, application. Speak, act, stand. Yes. And you can have what the Word says. You can try to do it outside of those steps. You probably won't have what the Word says. Anymore, you're going to guess how to build an airplane and fly across the Atlantic. There, see, the laws that govern this natural world are all guaranteed. They're all set. Gravity always works the same. I can write a formula out for you if you want me to. You know, electricity uh, uh, <coughs> works by stated laws. Fluid mechanics works by stated laws. We could go on, all these laws are stated and they work the same. They let you drive a car down the road and hope you don't have to guess where your brakes are going to work or not. They always work the same if your brakes are well, well cared for. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the kingdom of heaven produced those laws that we depend on now. Therefore, its laws must be equally or even more dependable than the natural laws. In fact, they're more dependable. Yes. Because by accessing the power of these laws, Jesus walked on the water. He overcame natural laws by accessing the power of kingdom laws. So purpose, plan, provision, promise, principles, access the provision out of the promise. Yes. This is you follow me, right? How boring? No. Can you repeat that one more time? Purpose, plan, steps. Or per you said purpose, plan, provision, principles. Purpose, plan, Provision, promise, principles. And the principles access the provision out of the promise. They extract what God said you can have because you're doing it by those spiritual laws, those kingdom laws. See, people today have a problem, really, most Christians don't really believe that there's power in what you say. You've heard it often enough, you probably believe that. The word makes it clear. Our words carry power. Yes. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. That's a kingdom principle. Yes. And if you don't believe that principle, you won't do it and you won't get the results of it. Yes. Well, you will get the results of it, it just won't be the results you want. Because right. you're speaking death and curse and defeat, you'll get that instead of life and health and blessing. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So step six. <coughs> we use the principles to access the the provision in the promises. Step six is power. Power. Once you plant a seed in the right soil <coughs> and your words germinate or allow that seed to bring forth life, the result is supernatural power. Mm -hmm. The power may come in the form of healing, healing anointing. It could come in the form of prosperity anointing. It could come in the form of strength anointing, peace, whatever. But there will be power connected to it. Amen. Amen. And Paul said our kingdom is not of this world. He said it's of power. Amen. Right? Amen. Our faith rests in the power of God. You want to walk in the power of God, you've got to follow these steps yes. to do it consistently. Yes. So faith people live in God's Pastor Callahan just turned 75 years old. He's on no medications, no pain in his body, no sickness in his body. Everything 
supernaturally. How can I say? Help was manifested. Well, he lives in that power. Those were proved eight sets of, it was it nine sets of blind eyes open at one time? Amen. That's power. If I understand the story. What? You're living according to these steps. And there's no other, there is, there is no other recipe to fulfill your destiny fully other than these. Which takes us to step number seven, the final step. We're going through these pretty quick. Go to Romans chapter eight. It's taken a long time in my mind. <laughs> Romans chapter eight. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do you understand where to be spirit led? Not once a year, but throughout each day. Yes. You're to be led by the peace of God within the Spirit of God produces. You're to be led by the voice of God directing your steps. And step number seven is process. Process. What process is, because God has a call, had a call in your life, we've gone through these other six steps. Process is the daily <coughs> hearing God <coughs> leading you how to do it. <coughs> this morning, I got up, I had my I've got my I can do a whole series on ludicrous grace. And yet I'm, I'm I'm praying about it, and inside I hear God saying, I don't want you to go all the way through that this morning. You touched it last night. You covered it. Enough for them to understand it's out there. I want you to teach us another message. Amen. What's I doing? That's a process. Yes. That's hearing God what He wants you to do the next step. And we're to be people that hear God and what the calling is. Amen. Hear God on what provision we need. Hear God what promises and claim. Hear God on when to claim them, what to speak. Yes. Hear God daily. What we need to do and address, what we need to read or study in the Word. That's our daily process. Now follow me on this. Your daily process is necessary to go into your destiny. Because as soon as you leave off step number seven, you're trying to do it yourself. And I found when I'm trying to do stuff myself, I get in trouble. I am, I'm told. I'm pretty good at working on the camera. In fact, in my house, there's not been a repairman in my house to work on appliance in over 30 years. I fix my appliances. If they break, I'm a tie that doesn't break down very often, but if they do, I fix them. But I've discovered my best bet if I want to fix them effectively, I need to pray first. Amen. Now I know I can fix a washing machine. I can tear a washing machine down and put it back together. I've been working on an ice cream machine lately quite a bit. <laughs> I know I can fix that machine myself. I know, I'll, I'll figure out how. But I found that if I don't pray first, say, God, help me with this. Help me do it in the right order. Don't let me miss anything, break anything. If I don't do that so many times. In fact, I worked on the other day and I didn't pray first and forgot a few weeks ago. And all I did is put this little switch in with two screws and I dropped a screw. And it went bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Clear down to the bottom. No, it's the part where the screw is the whole part. Bing, down to the bottom washing, underneath the thing, underneath the uh, cylinder or whatever. The tub, yeah. It was a front load underneath it. I had to pull the washing machine out, pull the back off, reach in there to get it out. It cost me a little half an hour because I didn't pray first. <laughs> if you'll pray, God will cooperate with you. If you don't, you get to do it yourself. The process keeps you connected to God through the whole seven steps. Now follow me. What was step number one? Oh, come on, hit me that long ago. Purpose, yes, purpose, purpose. I just like one like that. <laughs> when you get it or not, I probably will do that. Purpose, what did purpose mean? What was your purpose? To know God. What's the process? Spending time with God. Process actually. 
actually is the daily activation of purpose, which reconnects you to your purpose and keeps you in a cycle Amen. of going from faith to faith and glory to glory, step by step, and knowing you'll get God results. Yes. So I no longer beg God in prayer. I no longer hope and pray. I find what God said I can have. I speak it in faith and stand until I have it. So whatever is eating says is so. And then I get God results. Amen. Thank you for God results. Amen. So what I'm like leaving you with is just an outline. If you've written, written down these seven steps, this outline, whatever you're facing, find where you are in that, in that, in that process, in that, in that set of steps, and proceed to the next step. Yes. And it will take you where you need to go. Amen. 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 Now, Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you, Lord God, you're raising up a people that want to go into your glory, that want to fulfill your heart call. And I ask you, Lord God, to enhance a relationship with you, to speak to them, bring them visions, revelations, prophetic utterances, divine dreams. And I think you show each one here what you would have them do regarding their calling with you. But especially show them who they need to become. Reveal the internal changes they need to make. Show them things that may be standing in their way or blocking their path. And give them a heart to cooperate with the Spirit of God in your word to remove those hindrances. Thank you, Lord God, for a people that are in covenant, a people in divine order, a people that want the glory in their church, a people that won't hold anything back. As they step forth and trust you, I know you're going to take this church to extreme greatness. Thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you.